Um, so maybe you'll hear a few of the same things. I actually uh, learned I was a fill-in for tonight, so I'm honored to do that and happy to do that, happy to be here with you again. I'll just tell you a little bit about Liberty Council. Uh, Ed mentioned some about us, but as he said, we're a public interest law firm established in 1989, so we've been around for more than two decades now. And In fact, we do all of our work for free. Uh, nobody has ever paid a cent to be represented by Liberty Council. Uh, we advocate for religious liberty, the sanctity of life, and the traditional family. And we do that through litigation in the courtroom. We do that through ed education in the public arena and through uh, policy work as well. And as Ed said, we've been very successful. We try to give the Lord all the glory for that. But since 1989, we have a winning percentage uh, against the ACLU and other groups like that of nearly 90% when we go to court. And that's where we get applause. But the other thing you need to know about that is 95% of the time, we don't go to court because we're able to sit down across the table with someone, give them a phone call, uh, write them a letter, and give them a chance to change their mind. And so this literally is a David versus Goliath battle. Uh, as Ed said, uh, we have an annual budget of about $5 million a year. A couple of years ago, the ACLU raised $328 million above their normal $100 million annual budget, uh, funded with $28, $1 million plus gifts. And so, um, but we're very thankful at Liberty Council that we don't serve an almighty dollar, but we serve an almighty God. And so that's what we put our hope in, we put our faith in, we put our trust in that, and so on. I'll share with you a little bit more about Liberty Council as we go on tonight, but what I really want to talk about tonight is how to deal with these times of uncertainty. Anyone feel like we're in a time of uncertainty? Uh, it's almost a joke to you. It's so uh, relevant. Uh, lots of people are asking lots of questions like those you see up there on the screen. I'm going to have a job in the future. Uh, is this going to be the same type of country that it's always been? Uh, are liberties going to be taken away more and more like the cases that we deal with on a daily basis? There's a lot of uncertainty, and a couple of dates upcoming in the near future, we have a chance to play a specific role in helping to elect and put someone in office that uh, our hope and prayer is will represent, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the things that were integral to the founding of our nation. But I also want to talk to you tonight that while I believe in the importance of that, and I think that's uh, very critical to what's going on right now, I hope that we're not putting too much faith in any one man or any group of men to change this nation. Because as I see it, and as we see it in, at Liberty Council, uh, we shouldn't put our reliance in people, but in the one who created those people. And so the title of the talk tonight is Dependence Day. And I want to start by thinking about how our founding fathers introduced the life of this country. They, they, they based it on scripture, didn't they? We've seen that time and time again. I've got a little pamphlet in the back that it's called An Affirmation of America's Christian Heritage. And it just illuminates many of the different ways in which scripture and Christianity and faith in God, Judeo-Christian principles, were so central to the formation of our nation. So we're asking all these questions about what's going to happen and how are we going to make it. And I think back to the first century when uh, Jewish people were under Roman rule and they were asking the same questions. What's going to happen? How are we going to make it? How are we going to have our livelihood? And this is what Jesus Christ said to them. He said, why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They don't labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. And that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow still in the fire. Will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And here's the important part. What we really need to focus on today as a nation is to seek first his kingdom his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well therefore don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself isn't that true each day has enough trouble of its own so as you think about this tea party group and what your second <coughs> core principle is you want to recite that from memory i believe in god and he is central to my life as you think about that 
It reminds me that there were some other people who had that in mind when they started the formation of this nation. Go back to one of the founding documents, the Declaration of Independence. Look at what they write. It says, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of what? Nature's God. God. Entitle them. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator. creator. Let's not leave that part out like some people are doing with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And go on to list 27 different offenses, nearly 30 different offenses that Britain is perpetrating against the people of this land, and they're making their decision. This was not something that they took lightly. This was not something that they just did by happenstance. They were serious about this, and look what they write in the founding document. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress, assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions. That just means the plumbness, the rightness, uh, if these are true and straight or not. Do, in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge each other our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor. See, our founding fathers did know what it meant to rely on God, and to trust in God, and I would propose to you that one of the key reasons that they were leaving Britain was not just to declare independence from Britain, but to declare dependence on God. And I would suggest that as a people, we've got to get back to that again. John Adams knew this. He said, we took our horses to the meeting in the afternoon and heard the minister again upon, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The scripture we just read at the outset of this uh, time together today. There's great pleasure in hearing sermons so serious, so clear, so sensible and instructive as these, yet just a couple of years before the Declaration of Independence. So let's declare dependence. Tonight what I want to do is just go over five key things that I think will really help us to declare dependence as a people once again on God and why that's important and how that can benefit us as Americans, as people of this great land and how we can shape it. I'm going to use a text from the Bible. Anybody mind that I'm using the Bible tonight? Is that okay? Because if it's not, you you know, it's a free country, you're, you're welcome to get up and leave if you're offended by what you say the scripture. But you can't ask someone who works for a public interest law firm that defends religious liberty to come give a talk and not do the very thing I'm working every day to, uh, to protect. So indulge me uh, in this talk tonight. Let me read from the Bible. But this is a picture when Solomon has just built a temple, and he's standing, picture him on the front steps just with his hands raised to God and dedicating the temple. And he's asking God to do some specific things for the people. So let's read this passage. Uh, May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he never leave us nor forsake us. May he turn our hearts to him to walk in all his ways and keep the commands, decrees, and regulations he gave our fathers. And may these words of mine, which I have prayed before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night, that he may uphold the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel according to each day's needs so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and there is no other. But your hearts must be fully committed to the Lord our God to live by his decrees and obey his commands at, his, at this time. So we're going to look at this passage, break it down into five separate pieces, and I'm going to share with you five things that I think that each one of us can do, and collectively we can do, to make a big difference in this nation. Not relying on any one man, not relying on any uh, one group of men in Washington to lead us, but for us to really turn our faces back to God, it's one thing just for someone to say at a prayer breakfast to, to announce their faith in God or for someone to, on the campaign trail, say, yes, I believe in God, I believe in life. But when it comes down to it, what does that mean? Can we get beyond the surface acknowledgement of God and really think about what it means to declare dependence on God as a nation? So that's what I want to talk about. And the first thing I want to tell you is that we've got to defend the past. You're watching the American Heritage series, a great, uh, great series to watch. It tells a lot about the past. But Solomon, here he starts out by saying, May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he never leave us nor forsake us. So Solomon is acknowledging the fact that God has been instrumental in shaping the nation of Israel. And hasn't God been instrumental in shaping 
the United States of America, Washington said this, I'm sure that there never was a people who had more reason to acknowledge a divine interposition in their affairs than those of the United States, and I should be pained to believe that they have forgotten that agency, which is so often manifested during a revolution, or that they failed to consider the omnipotence that God, who is alone, able to protect them. Washington said God was all over this. God was in every part of that. And we see this prevalent within the Bible. I'm not going to read these scriptures word for word, but God is telling the people of Israel as they're going about and he's doing different things for them that their job is to teach their children and to talk about him uh, when, when they're getting up, when they're going out, when they're at home, all the time. He is to be center of mind, top of mind, and how easy is it for us just to day by day become a little bit complacent about what God has done for us and start to rely on ourselves or other people. We've got to remember the past. We're taking strides day by day to kind of forget the past. I don't know if you saw what happened recently. Yes. yes. Uh, Justice Ginsburg was talking to uh, mm. folks about the transition in Egypt. She basically said, our Constitution is not a very good role model for new nations that are out there. I don't really think we ought to look at our Constitution as a model document. And if you look at every other nation in the world, there's no nation that has had a standing Constitution as long as the United States of America. And why is that? It's because God was central to our past. But we have little by little started removing him from the equation. Early 60s, there was a landmark case where uh, the reading of the Bible and public prayer was taken out of the public schools. And then later on in the 80s, the Supreme Court said that you can't put the Ten Commandments on the wall in the classroom because students might read them and be motivated to follow them. We don't want people reading, do not kill, do not steal. So we've replaced the Ten Commandments with metal detectors in our schools. And so here's what happens as a result. If any of you have read uh, David Barton's American Godly Heritage, it's a book, not only a video series. But here's what's happened when we take uh, God out of schools. You see the, the black line going up and down on the chart there? This is the point at which we took God out of the public schools. And first of all, the public schools are not the only people who are indicted here. Uh, if kids aren't getting it at school, they ought to what? Get it at home. home. Exactly right. And so uh, we're, we're partly to blame in this as well. But we uh, no longer have the environments at the public schools since the uh, 60s. Uh, to, to teach about God and teach kids about God. And so we see uh, the number of violent crimes skyrockets, SAT uh, scores go down. Uh, birth rates for unwed girls skyrocket. Sexually transmitted diseases skyrocket. Divorce rates, uh, they go up. They're going down, but that's because nobody's getting married anymore. And so, uh, so, you know, it's kind of irrelevant. Unmarried couples living together going up. So all of these social demographic statistics, they seem to be going the wrong way. And it's because... We've declared independence as a nation from the responsibility of protecting our godly heritage. And it's so wonderful to see groups like this Tea Party rising up all across the country or wanting to uh, reinstate those principles and reinvigorate this act. So we've left it to our preachers. We see once a week in the faulty textbooks our kids use every day. To help them learn about faith and about the history of this country, we've got to take that back. We've got to declare dependence on God to teach our children and grandchildren what they need to know about life and about godliness. We can't let anyone else do that for us. So let me encourage you today, if you're not currently invested in teaching your...